Welcome back. Wow, that was easy. You guys are a really easy crowd. I am Greg Biggers. I am the chief instigator and CEO of Genomera Participant-Driven Clinical Trials. I'm also on the board of an advocacy organization called Genetic Alliance. And uh, everyone is disclosing something about their genome today, so here goes. I, uh, I suffer from a highly penetrant but poorly understood allele for forgetting to pack a razor. It's called the Don Johnson gene. No, I'm just kidding. But for those of you watching on the webcast, my face is not dirty. These are whiskers. Um, we're talking next about research paradigms. Now, I think that within a conference um, whose whole gestalt is about shifting paradigms, it's a little bit meta wrapped inside meta to have a series specific to paradigms. Um, but such are the lives of the peculiarly early adopters. Um, so as we engage with this next set of um, three talks, let's listen and converse about um, new ways of getting things done, um, how our roles are shifting and blurring, and um, some exciting or occasionally threatening feeling uh, power dynamics that are changing. So with that as our frame, um, we're going to start with um, Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll. Ed is a clinical lecturer at the University of College London Institute of Neurology, and uh, Jeff is an assistant professor at the Department of Psychology at Western Washington University. Um, and uh, Jeff is also a member of the PGP. So please welcome to the stage Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll. Thank you, Greg. And good afternoon. It's great to be here. So this is uh, Jeff's and my first GET conference. So we thought that it might be nice to get personal, if you'll excuse the terrible opening pun. Um, we'd like to tell you a little bit about ourselves as people. Um, by the way, I'd love to give my DNA for the PGP. Um, currently, I come from a country where I cannot donate it, but I'm first in line when it comes to the motherland, um, as I call it. Um, that's the wrong thing to say in Boston. Um, so I was born here. This is the Peak District in northwest England. Um, it was a very rural upbringing that I had. Uh, it's certainly literally true to say that I grew up with an outdoor lavatory for the first few years. And it's metaphorically true to say that when I was 10, my brother killed my pet kestrel. Um, a couple of uh, people got that reference. Um, I studied it. Cambridge, the real Cambridge. Um, the, uh, <laughs> oh, Jeff, you've got a lot of clawing back to do here. Yeah. The alma mater of Crick and Watson. And so I work at UCL now in, in uh, central London. Uh, I'm, my research is on Huntington's disease. Um, uh, most people here have heard of it. It's been mentioned already today. Um, in fact, in a, in a rather uh, nice setup, um, someone uh, the, in the previous session described it as uh, devastating. Uh, and in fact, if you read any scientific paper about Huntington's disease, you will read things in the abstract. They almost copy and paste them. Devastating, inherited, incurable, fatal, devastating, progressive. They, you, know, you don't need to read very far to get an idea of what a terrible disease this is. So this is the kind of clinical aspect of Huntington's disease as we see it in clinic. And the obvious thing you'll see is these involuntary movements known as chorea, which uh, gave the disease its original name, Huntington's chorea. The more disabling aspects are the loss of voluntary motor function, the loss of personality, the loss of cognitive function, psychiatric problems, um, and ultimately it is a fatal and un incurable disease. So over to Jeff. So hello, uh, I'm Jeff Carroll. I'm the American one. Uh, I didn't say the pretty one, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I had a rather less auspicious beginning than Dr. Wilde. I uh, grew up just south of Seattle in a large family with six kids uh, and decided to outsource my uh, growing up, since I was doing a fairly poor job of it, to the Army uh, and left uh, and joined the Army at the age of 19, uh, like a lot of young Americans do. I did it, luckily, in a time when that meant I had to go to Kosovo rather than Iraq, which was uh, smart. But uh, So this is a picture uh, from 1999 of uh, me in a small town near Jelani, Kosovo. 
Um, surprisingly, uh, the, the worst thing happening to me right now it, when this picture was taken was not that there were simmering Serbian, Albanian ethnic tensions, uh, but rather that just before I had deployed, my um, father had taken my new wife and myself and sat us down uh, at home on my pre-deployment leave and explained to us that uh, my mother, uh, Cindy Carroll, uh, was not only at risk for a disease I had never heard of, which was called Huntington's disease, but that in fact she had begun showing symptoms uh, and was in fact no longer able to live on her own. Um, so this was, uh, this was news to us, uh, and we had, frankly, no idea what to do with it. Uh, you can imagine 1999, uh, the information that's available uh, is, is much worse than it is today. Thanks to the genius of the Internet Wayback Machine, you can see this is a front page of a Huntington's disease patient website called the Huntington's Disease Lighthouse, uh, which was a great resource for people to make connections, uh, community connections to form, and people with a rare disease to find one another. This is the great thing about the Internet, and these are early days. Obviously, this is February 20th, 2001. At that time, I was actually in Kosovo, probably saw this page on that day. Um, and the, the wonderful thing that happened with those websites was that connections were made between people. And people with a rare disease were able to make connections, as we've talked about today. Uh, less good things that happened out of that were that people uh, shared uh, scientific information without usually knowing how to vet it. So there's some examples on this page that you can pick out, you know, fighting HD with diet according to Andrew Wheel, or you know, these kinds of things. Uh, EPA, which is a fatty acid, reversing Huntington's disease in two small trials, which of course didn't replicate and probably wasn't true. Um, and this continues. So even today, this is uh, more modern uh, information from the same site, which again is a fantastic place for community members to meet one another. You can uh, go there, however, and get pitched by this guy, uh, the idea that you should go to this clinic and receive peripheral injections of shark cells uh, which uh, he suggests has cured his Huntington's disease and could cure yours too if you just pay enough money and believe in this therapy. So this was not good enough for me. So uh, concerned that I uh, needed to know more about what Huntington's disease was all about, I got out of the Army in 2001 and went and joined the laboratory of uh, Dr. Michael Hayden, a prominent Huntington's disease researcher in uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, I did uh, my bachelor's and ultimately a PhD back-to-back -back in Vancouver under Michael's supervision working on mouse models of Huntington's disease. Uh, during uh, my time in university, I also decided that I needed to find out my own information, not just about Huntington's disease generally, but about my family's uh, risk for Huntington's disease, and, and mine in particular, of course. So I underwent uh, predictive testing for Huntington's disease in the second year of my undergraduate degree uh, and learned uh, through the course of that testing that, in fact, I, I carry the same mutation uh, that at the time was killing and ultimately killed my mother. Uh, subsequently, uh, three of my siblings have received the same news. So uh, it was interesting to have the previous session set up the idea that the receiving a, a positive diagnosis of Huntington's disease and predictive testing is the most devastating case. Uh, and, and I'm not here to say, but I'm happy to talk to people afterwards about why it's not always devastating the positive things that have come out of it. But uh, we only have 19 minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, a small plug for uh, something else that came out of my time in Vancouver is that I became a volunteer in a long-term observational study called PREDICT HD, which is a deep phenotyping study of Huntington's disease patients. So longitudinal MRI, neuropsychiatric testing, wet biomarker collection, you name it, uh, every, uh, partner reports of, of uh, mood, everything has been collected uh, from me and hundreds of other volunteers who are asymptomatic carriers of the Huntington's disease mutation. So I have something like eight years of longitudinal data uh, that's been collected in a very rigorous and, and well-described way, which is all in dbGaP, which, of course, uh, is blinded currently. Uh, I've just received word uh, from uh, Jane Paulson, the, the head of PREDICT uh, at the University of Iowa, that uh, in informally so far that her IRB uh, has suggested that they are going to be able uh, to unblind my PREDICT data uh, and connect it with uh, my genome once it's generated, since I've recently volunteered to become a member of the Personal Genome Project. So, uh, as well as the 60th anniversary of the structure of DNA being described this year, in fact, last month was the 20th anniversary of the uh, publication of the uh, discovery of the Huntington's disease gene and mutation uh, in 93. And um, 20 years of concentrated effort by uh, an incredibly motivated international research community has generated a phenomenal amount of really good research, which is just now um, culminating in treatments many treatments designed with Huntington's disease in mind and the specific molecular and genetic uh, pathobiology of Huntington's disease. These will be going into the clinic in the next year or two, and we're going to need, need lots of patients uh, to help us run those trials. Um, the patients themselves are an extremely motivated community, and they want to know what's going on. However, when um, uh, 
information about the paper I showed uh, just there, which is about silencing the Huntington gene in which Roche, Roche just invested $32 million. When patients read that kind of thing, they can't understand it. They get a sense that it's good news, but they don't know how good. They don't know how soon it's going to apply to them. And many times they can't actually access the original scientific paper, even if they could understand it, if they got through to it. So to an extent it's understanding, to an extent it's money. Many papers are behind paywalls. And the flip side of this $100 bill, of course, is that essentially all research is funded by the public. Even if they're not funding it through their tax dollars, they're funding it through the money they pay with their cash and, national, and their insurance contributions through the drug companies. So money's part of it and part of it's understanding. But as I say, we have this extremely engaged patient and family community. Unusually, um, at our HD scientific meetings, around half the people in the audience will be family members and patients themselves. They're extremely active. They quiz the scientists. There's a real feeling that there's this hunger for them, among them for knowing what's going on, but that they're not getting back the information in a, in a means that they can decipher it. So it's like these Amazon parcels. Um, the, in, the thing has been manufactured, it's been delivered, but the delivery guy has left it under the doormat and got back in his van. Um, it's almost useful, but that 1% of extra effort is everything to the person inside the house. To think of it another way, hope is an automatic byproduct of scientific research and we have a forced choice as scientists. We can either let it evaporate uselessly into the air by not engaging with the public whom we serve, or with a small amount of reprocessing, we can turn it into something incredibly useful that no other thing can achieve. So uh, I'll, I'll explain in just a second. But uh, <laughs> uh, Ed and I were introduced in 2009 by our mutual friend and another HD family member, uh, community member, uh, Charles Sabine, an NBC News correspondent. Uh, who had been asked to uh, host a session at the end of every night of the Huntington's Disease World Congress, wherein you have a family stream and a science stream meeting in parallel the same place. So he'd been asked every night to bring everybody together at the end of the sessions and, and talk about what had happened to each group. And he said he would be willing to do that, but he needed a clinician and a researcher dumb enough uh, to sign up to uh, help him uh, do that every night. Uh, and we're the dumb ones. Uh, Ed got a chance to exercise his really embarrassing Photoshop skills every night. That's me as a barista, in case you missed it, in front of 800 of my professional colleagues. Um, but the, 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 all fun aside, I mean, the, the response from patients was, was really fantastic. And we realized that we, were, uh, we had stumbled onto something that was actually really important, and that patients were hungry, uh, and that we were in a unique position potentially to help uh, give them some information. So uh, with a little nod to Boston, here's our motivating truths that we hold to be self-evident. First, uh, that a scientific work is not complete until it's been understood by those who need it most. That in fact, we have a moral prerogative as scientists to make sure that our work is communicated to the affected patient communities. Second, all science can be explained and that given uh, a sufficiently motivated uh, learner and um, the right amount of time, uh, a scientist should be able to explain uh, why their work is exciting and meaningful to a patient. Uh, towards that end, we, uh, we came up with this idea of this project called, we call HD Buzz. The main website is at hdbuzz.net. The tagline says it all. It's Huntington's Disease Research News in plain language written by scientists for the global Huntington's Disease community. Here's uh, roughly how it works. So we have writers, uh, more writers now, which is exciting. Uh, that are around the world, all of whom are experts in the field, but yet not connected to the work about which they're writing. They write a short, readable news story about a uh, recent advance in clinical or basic research in Huntington's disease. They send it to Ed or I, who are in Bellingham and London, respectively. Uh, and uh, we edit it for style, and we post it up to the website, which is Creative Commons licensed, so anyone can do anything they want with it. We more assertively distribute the content by having JavaScript integration into the lay group websites, a, a number of them. Uh, as well as having social media outreach via Twitter, Facebook, email. I mean, we'd send it out by carrier pigeon if we had to. It's just the point is to get people the information. This is the front page of the website. As of about two days ago, the Roche announcement is featured. Uh, and you can see some, some links to some content. But generally, it's very heavily focused on what's happening right now, what's the latest research news. If you click on an article, you'll see that uh, you know, the article comes up with headings and a thermometer icon, which we sort of subjectively try to tell people how exciting something is, uh, links to PDF and sharing, and critically links to the original paper, which we're discussing, the original piece of research, which is almost never done in press releases about science, which is silly. Uh, we, we do have to use the occasional bit of jargon. When we do, we have a, a glossary with very simple explanations. You can hover over words that are sciencey and see a simple description. 
Um, and we, we end each story um, with a context. Now, this is what's missing from press releases and the other kinds of uh, nonsense that gets posted on the internet now, uh, is, is a really meaningful sense of what the context is. What does this particular advancement mean for this community? Uh, so we try very hard on, on that to, to end with the context. We realize Huntington's patients don't all speak English, uh, so we uh, have volunteer translators, and we now have 13 languages launched in which you can see HDBuzz content, Spanish and Chinese shown there, which is fun to see your stuff in Chinese. Uh, this, is, this is what it looks like when we give content to a lay site. The point is not to pull their users and their community away from the lay organizations, but rather to inform them. So we directly put our content on their sites. They don't have to update. They don't have to dedicate a staff member to doing this. They don't have to learn science. They just have to trust us, which has worked so far. Uh, we have a, a custom-built backend, so we can do both do editing as well as uh, translating uh, on web. So it's all distributed, it's all online, and it's it's all pretty slick on the backend, which makes it work. These are sites which feature our content currently. There's a number uh, and a growing number of sites which have our feeds and and put their, our news out to their people. And this is uh, our kind of interim status report. These are some figures uh, we launched uh, a little over two years ago. Um, I won't read them all out, but uh, the ones we're particularly happy with are 76 volunteer translators around the world, all working for nothing, uh, translating it because this stuff is important to them and the people that they know. Some of them are scientists, some of them are lay family members, and they um, translate collaboratively. On average, we get around 200,000 page views per month, which considering this is a pretty rare disease, we're very pleased with. And essentially what we're giving people is a thing that we uh, aspirationally refer to as substantive hope. Um, we think that hope is good, and we assume that every Huntington's disease family member has the hope that they, i.e. scientists, will cure Huntington's disease, and we're fully on board with that hope. But uh, the way that you achieve something like that is by breaking the impossible task down into a small number of very difficult tasks. And we think that by giving people uh, updates on each of these little tasks, we supply them with little nuggets of substantive hope so that every day or perhaps once or twice a week, they can wake up and read one little bit of hope and one next thing to hope for. And if there's a disappointment, that's one small step back rather than that they're in, the, you know, in, their, that then they're in free fall. The feedback we've had through the website uh, started coming pretty much as soon as we pressed the button and has told us that we basically now have no choice but to carry on with this project. Um, what we're particularly gratified with is the, the message that we get that people are reading it and appreciating it and that it is also driving them to be actively involved in research participation. Comments like, I enjoyed this article because I'm a pre-symptomatic person with the HD gene. Hopefully, I will be able to be part of this research. This one came through yesterday about the Roche deal. This guy says, I'm just a lowly drywaller without a lot of education. One of my younger siblings has HD. Thank you for the info, and hopefully human trials will start soon. A little nugget of substantive hope. Occasionally, we're reminded of the work that is yet to be done by us and by our community. This comment came through in Portuguese, and this is the translation. My family needs a cure. Do not have much time. Seven were hit by this genetic disaster. How do I get it out of me? And in our Google uh, News search inboxes, we also receive uh, fairly frequent messages of the work that remains for us. This is from the abysmal uh, rag, the Daily Mail. Um, ask any English person with sense, and they'll tell you this is the worst thing in the world. Uh, and in this article, apart from the fact that they've dramatically overhyped the news story, they can't even spell the name of the disease correctly in the headline. Um, so we've slightly broadened our remit of late in order to try and engage with this uh, tendency for what you might call press release journalism, copying and pasting of hastily written overhyped press releases. We, we published 10 golden rules for reading a scientific news story. And in January, we had a pretty vivid uh, demonstration of the potential value and interest of this when at uh, the University of New Orleans, after publishing a, a fairly well executed but not exactly earth-shaking piece of research involving a genetic manipulation that was so far from a mouse treatment that we would otherwise not have reported on, sorry, for a human treatment that we would otherwise not have reported on it. The press release announced that they had discovered a way to delay symptoms of deadly Huntington's disease. And this came up in all of our followers' uh, Google news searches such that we were impelled to write an article entitled, the University of New Orleans has not discovered a cure for Huntington's disease. 
Um, this uh, made it to the front page of Reddit in January. It's not so far up, it's actually down at the bottom, uh, just below Stop Calling Him Nazi Pope. Um, and that day, we had around half a million uh, page views, which made our tech guy age about 20 years. Uh, we were initially concerned that we were the only two foolish enough to embark on this project, uh, and we're worried about getting other writers. Uh, we we uh, have done a few things, including having a prize for young writers and have been getting young scientists to volunteer uh, and have actually been more successful than we would have hoped. Uh, so we now have some great writers, uh, and, and we would like to argue that, in fact, that not every scientist should try to communicate with the public. Communication is not a normally distributed skill, um, but that there are a lot of trainees, a lot, who would benefit uh, as scientists or clinicians uh, for having done some communication. And so we're, we're seeing the benefits of that in people we work with. We don't just say bad things about scientists behind their back. We tried to say it to their face. So we wrote an editorial recently and said what we're saying to you, to the scientific community. Um, We've hosted a symposia recently at the Society for Neuroscience. We hosted a symposium on these issues, uh, uh, which well, I think was successful and, and let us reach out to other disease areas. Uh, so generally, we've been trying to reach out to scientists as well as to uh, patient groups. We know that there's good science happening. Uh, and Ed and I know this. We sit in meetings all year, and we, we hear this amazing science. But there's a gap between the good science being done uh, and the media reports about it. And that causes practical problems as well as having you know, moral uh, consequences. And that is poor trial recruitment, less funding, less, study, uh, less subjects available for studies. So we're, we're hoping that if we can fill this little gap uh, with scientist-led dissemination, so appropriate communication of the news, that we can have uh, not only moral benefits, but also have practical benefits for this rare disease community. And in the uh, spirit of celebrating the 60th anniversary of the DNA structure, a uh, We've taken a wild liberty by uh, quoting from the uh, uh, almost final paragraph of Crick and Watson's paper. They were talking about uh, an allusion to the uh, replication mechanism of DNA. It has not escaped our notice that there is nothing particularly special about Huntington's disease when it comes to this novel way of thinking about engaging with the public and with patient communities. There is no reason why, for instance, we couldn't have an Alzheimer's or Parkinson's buzz, a uh, cancer buzz, or whatever. Um, and certainly, uh, we uh, have a platform and a way of thinking that would be, uh, that would be genericizable to other areas. I think that's all we have to say. Jeff would just like to thank some people. Uh, so this, this project wouldn't have happened if our funders hadn't given us money when it was just a crazy idea. Uh, so we had some, uh, an amazing group of uh, agencies, uh, mostly lay organizations, that gave us money. We should point out that none of these have a, a commercial interest in developing treatments for Huntington's, which we think is really important, although we love drug companies. Um, and so this, uh, to thanks to our, our funders very much for their support. Thank you. And I think we have about four minutes for questions, and there seems to be a human-shaped form that way. Uh, hi. Keith Batch, Elder, PGP7. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, what I think is incredible work that you've done. Um, but since you talked about the uh, potential to have other uh, aggregate uh, communities and how you think it's uh, potentially replicable for other communities, I'd love you to explain that a little bit more because I think maybe I think that the Huntington's community is maybe different than other communities, um, both in terms of the scale and in terms of the commitment. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'd love you to uh, talk about that and see if you think there are uh, parts of your community that make it unique and maybe not scalable. Should I? Um, so uh, one thing is I wouldn't. I don't know if I would use the word community. We've been a little bit hierarchical, surprising for how open we are, in that we're, our job is to drive good content into the stream of news, not deal with community issues like we saw with patient, uh, patients like me and things like this. So we, we're kind of a source, not a community. And I think it's a distinction with a difference. Um, and so I think sufficiently motivated people in any disease field could do it. I, you're right that HD is very discreet. Whereas, say, for example, Parkinson's, you would have 
you know, idiopathic people versus genetic people, and that might be tricky. But I think we could pilot this with other small, rare genetic diseases, and I, I think that would be interesting. Our software, for example, in practical terms, is portable, and so we think that that would be useful for other conditions. I think there's the, the one thing that distinguishes the HD community is the heritable nature of research participation. So if you have Alzheimer, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, it's likely that if you engage in research at all, it will be for four or five years, and then you will pass away. And at that point, your family may give a donation to the research service, but are themselves, if there's no familial uh, feeling to the history, that they're likely, more likely to disengage. Many of our community members and our research participants are doing it for their kids or their nieces and nephews. And I think that's certainly something which uh, increases the tenacity of the um, individuals and the, uh, the, the reach of our uh, research. People know that they are at risk. Um, however, I mean, I think that, I think another issue would be the, the scale of research. So Huntington's is a very active um, field, you know, and there's a couple of dozen pa new papers a week. Uh, I suspect that it's, it's been a while since I was involved in Alzheimer's, but there's certainly a lot more to sift through in the Alzheimer's field. Um, but I, I do think that, that there's, there's no qualitative barrier provided that it was approached in the right way to expanding this idea. And of course, we're certainly not going to stand here and say that this is the first time that anyone's ever communicated with the patient community. Um, we just perhaps have a slightly more systematic and systematized way of doing it. Thanks. Question from the uh, this is I'm Peter Gregerson. I'm from the Feinstein Institute in New York. And uh, your comments about communicating science from scientists to the public really resonate because just yesterday we had the final competition where all our postdocs actually compete for four slots to present their work uh, to the public and they go through a rigorous review to do that. And it seems to me that that, and probably there are other places that are doing that, it might be nice to nationalize that and have some kind of a, a national competition where postdocs who are interested in this and who are talented can really uh, get exposure and the satisfaction of, of communicating well with the outside world. Absolutely. And I think one of the things on our radar is uh, formalizing through studying it directly our hypothesis that engaging patients by simply telling them what you're doing and what it might mean uh, actually does have knock-on effects for public engagement in your research and the actual speed with which you can recruit your trials and so on. And I think that if we can prove that, then there'll certainly be an argument for putting money into every young scientist's training to teach them how to do it. These are skills that are partly innate but can certainly partly be taught. Uh, you can certainly tell people that this is important and you know these days a lot of grant applications require you to demonstrate public uh, mm. engagement but no one's actually teaching young scientists how to do it and giving them an experience of how good it feels when people thank you for telling them what your job is. Yeah. And I'm sorry we have to cut off the questions there. Uh, so radical accessibility to research results. Thank you Ed and Jeff. Thank you.